Welcome everybody, this is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley, and we work hard every week to bring you stories that we think will inspire you. We have particular interests in education, uh, in innovation, and technology, and, and what we have going today kind of hits all of those fronts, which makes me very happy. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a good group with us uh, on the recording as well. Special shout out to uh, all of the folks uh, down under in, in Australia who are joining us. Uh, from different Rotary Act and Rotary Clubs, and it is totally cool to have you with us as well. Our speaker today is Laura Pickle, and Laura works with IDOU. She works with SAP. She's part of the Stanford School of Engineering as well. She's got she's got a pretty amazing resume there, uh, and all the more fun uh, that that I got to meet her when she was helping host a group of students from a school that I work with, and we got to talking. I said, "Oh, we would love to have someone, you know, with your talent to speak to our club," and she said, "Well, tell me more about it." And so here we are. So with that, I would like to hand things over to Laura to, uh, to present to us, and then after that, we will move to our Q&A. Our other participants, it is typical, we, typically we, we mute our, our microphones and cameras while we let uh, the presenter present, but uh, you are welcome to, do, uh, to, to continue to look on uh, with, with interested facial expressions if you wish. So Laura, it is all yours. Go right ahead. Awesome. Thanks, Rushton. And it's, yes, thank you to everyone that showed up live, too. This is uh, exciting. I'm excited for your questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to go into full screen mode with this, and sometimes you lose the visual. So if, you, if anybody's live and you can't see something, um, verbally let me know instead of waving at me. Uh, so... Uh, thank you to the eClub of Sil Rotary eClub of Silicon Valley. Um, I am here to talk a little bit about design thinking. Mostly, what I'm going to be talking about is an introduction. Much of this might be familiar. Hopefully, it's a good review for you. Um, and then towards the end, I'll talk a little bit about the work that I do at SAP, which is actually, like Rushton said, how I got to know him. Uh, so, um, like Rushton said, I work for SAP. Uh, the Stanford D School or the Stanford School of Mechanical Engineering and then IDOU. Uh, at SAP I'm a user experience designer. Um, at the D School and at Stanford I teach classes on a wide range of things. Um, I think of myself as kind of an instructional designer um, and so I work with subject matter experts to put together meaningful, experiential, hands-on classes. And then at IDOU, I'm a teaching team lead for many of their online classes. So I'm gonna start with the probably the most familiar of all of the design thinking processes that you might run across. This is the Stanford D School uh, five-step empathize, define, ideate, prototype test. Um, so I'm gonna give you a quick example, and then I'll also go a little bit more in depth on each of these stages so you can get a sense of why each of these stages is important. Um, so let's say you're given a design challenge. This is how we often start um, our classes, start at, at business. Um, you start with some kind of design challenge. So let's say you were given the design challenge of redesigning the uh, airport delay experience. I'm sure many of you have experienced this. You show up in an airport and your flight is two hours delayed. What can you do in that time? What is, what is a, something that you could redesign to make that experience better? So in the empathized phase, so the first, first stage, um, you would go out and you'd talk to lots of people. You'd talk to passengers, passengers who uh, have different backgrounds, so maybe a business, business woman or a family who's traveling. Um, you might also talk to people uh, who are working at the airlines, so people at the, at the gate or a pilot. Um, you'd talk to as many people as you could to get as many different perspectives as possible. And then you move into define, where you decide which of those perspectives you really want to design for. So as you can imagine, if you design for a flight, to, a flight attendant, it might be a different thing than what you might design for a family. So the define stage is really deciding who it is that you're designing for. Um, this is really the problem finding part of the process. And then the next part is the solution finding part of the process. So ideate coming up with lots and lots of solutions. So in the airport example, what are all the different solutions you might choose to make for a family if that was the point of view that you decided to design for? You'd prototype lots of really low resolution prototypes and then you'd test them with real users to see whether they make sense. And like I said, I'm going to go through each of these in more detail, um, but that's the rough overview of the five-step process. Uh, SAP has its own process, very similar, um, discover, design, deliver. I think one of the big 
things that is different about our process is this delivery or the implementation of the design that you've created. Much of the in academics, you don't need to think about the actual delivery of a product. So um, the design thinking process, the way that I just talked about it, really fits into the discover and design. Um, and then deliver is really the thing that industry is looking for. And just to say, almost every big company that you've probably heard of these days has their own design thinking process. So IBM has this really interesting iterative loop, um, which is really following the same steps as the design thinking process that I shared before. And the SAP process, Intuit has one, Google has one. Many companies have their own version. Um, they all kind of follow this um, more academic looking version of the process. So it's a series of divergence and convergence where you start with trying to find the right problem and then you move into trying to find the right solution. So all of the design thinking processes that you will run across will be some kind of version of, of this. So to go a little bit into each of the steps of the design thinking process and why it's important, um, empathize, I always like to talk about um, the difference between big data and thick data when I'm talking about the value of empathy work. Um, so Clifford Geertz uh, talks about, gave the, the name to thick data and really talks about the insights that you can get from stories and the depth of those insights. Um, if you can imagine hundreds of pictures of somebody closing one eye, if you just looked at the pictures, you might say, are they winking or are they twitching? You can't tell by just looking at the big data that comes from hundreds and hundreds of pictures of somebody closing one eye. Thick data is what helps to give context to all the big data that you might find. Um, so in a lot of ways, big data is your business's worldview. So um, what your business's perspective is on the data. Whereas thick data is really your customer or your user's worldview, and I think that's the big difference that design thinking offers is really giving that customer or user-centered version of, of what the problem might be and what problem you might want to find. So this is the value of empathy work. It's really getting to know the user, really getting to know what is the context behind all of the, maybe the bigger data points that you're seeing. So then in Define, like I said, there are lots and lots of different frameworks that we use. A Define is where I would say uh, we spend the most time. It takes a long time to unpack lots of interviews. And so this is just one of many frameworks that you might see for a defined stage. So this is the say, do, think, feel map, um, where you can see that on the say and do, there's this more observed version of the, the facts that you've seen. These are things that you actually heard or you actually saw the users do. And then the think and the feel is your inferred interpretation of of what the users were, were thinking and feeling. Um, this is also the part of the process where I really think your role as a designer starts to, to come in because the, the way that you're gonna inf um, infer what people are saying and doing is gonna really influence the next part of the process. Um, but they're all grounded, importantly, in that contextual knowledge and data that you've got in the empathy stage. So then to move from define to ideate, and you might remember this is moving from problem finding to solution finding, you uh, use this top secret phrase, the phrase, secret phrase that top innovators use. I think it's, there's a lot written about this phrase. It's a very simple phrase. Um, it's how might we. Um, so it's a way to frame problems. Um, and that, well, the way that, the reason that we use these three words, how suggests that the solution is possible. It's not saying can we. It's saying how might we? Uh, and then might is saying there, there are lots of different possibilities. It's not saying there's only just one. And then we suggest that it's collaborative. So it's not something that, that you're designing, but it's something that maybe your team is designing and you're designing for the user. Um, so this how might we phrase moves us from taking that problem to thinking about solutions. And then in ideation, we like I said, come up with lots and lots of solutions. I think of this as kind of a fancy way of saying brainstorm. Um, so there are lots of tips that go into brainstorming. Um, and I think the biggest things are, this is the time really to go for quantity and ideas, not quality. Um, you wanna come up with as many ideas as possible, because if you can imagine having 100 ideas in front of you, the likelihood that a few of them is good is much higher than if you only have 10. Um, so, that's the biggest take the biggest key to having a successful brainstorm. 
Um, and then I like to put prototype and test kind of together because I think of it as a really quick iterative process where you're trying something out, you're testing it with somebody, you're taking what you find, and then you're coming back to prototype more. Um, so I'm going to talk about them kind of at the same time. Uh, and I'm just going to walk through some examples of prototypes just to give you a sense of what a prototype could look like. So um, physical prototype, um, this is an example from IDEO where um, they were trying to prototype this medical device. I believe it's a dental device. And in order to just get the sense of, is this the right feel, they just went into their closet. They saw what they could find. You can see like a closed pin and a marker and tried to just get the sense of, is this the right feel for what this tool might be? Um, so that's the idea with prototypes is you want it to be really rough and give the essence of what you're, the question that you're trying to answer. Um, then there's digital prototypes. So this example is a pretty famous one. Um, if you Google IDEO Elmo video, this one will pop up for you. Um, but basically this iPhone screen that you see is actually a cardboard cutout and the person behind the screen is a live person. Um, and then they're just imitating what you might be, what interactions you would have without actually writing any code. Um, Similarly with this one, no code necessary, but it's giving you the sense of what is the interactions that you might have in an app. Um, and I think what's important about this example especially is that the lower the fidelity or resolution the prototype is, the better feedback you actually end up getting because if you see this, you, really, you know that they didn't put too much time into it. You know that it was something that they really quickly put together. And so as a feedbacker, I feel more willing to give them real answers and real suggestions for this, this idea that they've come up with because I know that I'm not going to be knocking down their ego by suggesting that things might change or might be different. Um, this is uh, a great example of an experience prototype, and this is, comes from the movie The Founder. Um, it's which is about the founding of McDonald's and I love this this video or this clip in this in in the movie Because it is really showing you it's on a tennis court and they've essentially laid out all the different Tools that they would need in the back of the the fast food and then they actually are having these actors act out the the creation of all of these different um Foods that they're going to need to serve their customers and you can see kind of over on the left. There's people running into each other. And so they were able to really quickly erase what was on the white, on the tennis court and then rearrange, put the different uh, equipment in different places. Again, have them go through the actions and see again where the flow was working or not. Um, so in general with prototypes and particularly with experience prototypes, you have some kind of a scene, you have these props, and then you have roles that people are acting out in that, in that prototype. So that is a very fast 10-minute uh, version of what design thinking is. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about just the ways that we use it um, at SAP. Um, one is that there's this community that we've created at SAP called Design It Business. You can see there's a LinkedIn group that you can join if you're interested. It's basically a group of people who uh, are designers at various, design practitioners at various companies. And we get together to share best practices and co-create solutions that everybody in industry can use. So, for example, we've created design mindsets, so the underlying mindsets that you need in order to engage in the process, specifically within a business context. And um, they've actually written a white paper on it, and you can find it at the tiny URL at the bottom there. Um, similarly, they've actually thought through the skill sets that are important in a project team. So this isn't just design skill sets, but if you were to put together a collaborative group of people, um, what are the different skill sets that might be needed? And again, you can find the, the white paper that they've written at the tiny URL there. Um, and these, again, are not just SAP employees writing this. It's actually from folks across industry who are creating these. Um, and great resources to use if you're interested in thinking about what kind of mindsets and skill sets you might want to bring to your company. Um, and then quickly, what I do is mostly bring design thinking into the classroom. So my background is in education, and um, I believe in experiential education, bringing the, the real world into the classroom. Um, and so this is actually a teacher that I've worked with who, um, 
in the back you can see a course design canvas and in one row we ask teachers to think about the academic content they cover but then also in another row we ask them to think about what is the real world input that they might want to bring into their classroom and in another row what is a project that they might be able to incorporate into their classroom given the real world input that they're having so we're really trying to help teachers develop the kinds of mindsets and skill sets that the design at business community is considering in the classroom um, so that the students come to us ready to engage in those ways. Um, and then we also have a, a resource for teachers as well. Um, it's called build.me slash teach design. We're redesigning it as we speak, but um, free and available to teachers. If you know a school that's interested in design thinking, please feel free to reach out. I would love to communicate with schools who want to be more experiential, hands-on, bring design thinking into their classrooms. Um, and then I'm just going to end with a few resources um, in case this was too quick of an introduction and you want to learn more. Um, I, my team at SAP has put together a bunch of resources on the build.me slash learning uh, page. So you can see different tools on, from each step of the process that we use. Um, the Stanford D School has lots of resources. IDOU offers courses. So these are each places where you can find resources. And then uh, my team at SAP also puts together a ton of complimentary online learning experiences on design thinking. Um, full courses like Design for Non-Designers or the Basics of Design Research. And then the methods and tools are on that learning page that I mentioned before. And with that, I think I'm going to wrap up so that we're not, we, we stick within the 15 minutes so that we can get to questions. Excellent. Laura, thank you so much for, for that. There are a lot of links there that we'll want to share for sure. So I might yeah. uh, get, get your help in either getting the slides available as a link or, or getting those extra links available that we can share uh, you know, a little farther down in this. So, so let's kind of get things started with some questions. Got, uh, got, a, got a variety of people in the room. Um, my first question is this, there are so many different places and, and kind of activities that you can apply design thinking principles. And so, you know, you can, I mean, there's a lot of kind of standard things to imagine, whether it's a, a software interface, you know, whether it's, a, you know, it, it, it's layout of a particular space, anything. I'm guessing you've had the chance to talk with some people about some pretty unusual uh, uh, applications for design thinking and I'm curious if there's one or two that stand out that you might share. Um, wow yeah I yeah I mean I think there's there's a theory in some ways some people believe that design thinking can be applied to anything um, I don't know if I totally believe that but I have definitely seen um, some great examples so a lot of the classes that I teach at the D school are actually these um, two or three um, two or three day pop-ups is what they call them. Um, so they're, they're not for credit for students and for the community at, at Stanford. And some of the classes that I've taught, um, I've taught redesigning, uh, I'm going to actually pull some of them up. Um, reimagining and redesigning, uh, the interviewing experience, um, designing transitions. I actually ran one that was called, uh, sensory storytelling through chocolate. Um, so we actually applied the design thinking process to the des design of chocolate. Uh, we, a lot of what I do is design culture. Um, I teach classes at Stanford around how do you think about the culture that is, is necessary for creativity. Um, I'm actually teaching a class, um, I'm in the middle of it right now, called Designing for Death. And so we're actually looking at um, end of life experiences and how you can apply the design thinking process to those experiences. Um, and then I would also add that um, there you can also design for life. <laughs> um, so there's a whole, whole group of um, classes at Stanford that are called Designing Your Life or Designing Your Stanford. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of like you can run the gamut with, with types of things to apply design thinking to. So when we think about how how this comes across, not just as as app, you know, kind of a problem, creative problem solving possibilities, and, and as a framework, um, as I see it, you know, you think about how people work in in a normal school setting, and and they're they're often locked into to very traditional and not particularly imaginative ways of learning, right? You know, there's a right answer, and you do either do or don't have it, which only has so much relevance, you know, kind of in, in the larger world, you know, whether, whether you can properly answer a, a multiple choice question. 
But for a lot of the students that we see in the design thinking program at the school where I work, this is their chance to really think much more uh, in much more interesting ways about how to how to come at problems that may have seemed, you know, wickedly difficult, right? Uh, do do the students in your in your Stanford classes do they come at at some different projects with with big questions as they go, or they say, you know, we I really want to you know take on homelessness in in, in my area or or things like this. Yeah, a lot of times the way we structure our classes is we actually provide the students with the design challenges. So um, like at the beginning when I was saying the airport experience and redesign the airport experience, that's we usually give the students some kind of frame and then a big part of design thinking is then reframing. And so um, like with the culture ex class, for example, that's a full quarter class that I've taught. And so we might say, how might we redesign the culture of, of Silicon Valley organizations, which feels huge. Um, and then uh, they would then reframe it to say like, how might we increase collaboration? Um, or how might we uh, increase the ability to self express within the workplace? So I think a lot of, um, a lot of what we do is give them a frame that then allows them to, to open up and, and go in lots of different directions. I think as a teacher, it can be a little scary or a little, it's definitely a different way of teaching um, to be able to, to think in this way because um, you don't know which directions they're going to take that initial challenge. And I think that's a lot of the fun, but a, definitely a lot of the challenge that teachers feel. So that's not quite an answer to your question, but <laughs> I decided that's the question I answered. <laughs> I understand perfectly that approach. No worries at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we've got a whole host of, of guests from Australia joining us uh, for, for this recording. And I got a question from Stephen. So Stephen, pipe in. And, and what, have, what have you got to ask uh, Laura? So um, I have a bit of a question just around um, with the um, SAP version of effectively the double diamond that you came up with. So discover, design, and um, develop. So looking at that, I guess one challenge that I've had in my workplace, and I guess a lot of workplaces have, is the double diamond is a very abstract sort of process. Um, is there any sort of issue, you know, with us, I guess, you know, using that sort of tool within our own organizations and that sort of thing, using that same sort of process that's been come up with those um, three steps? You mean the, like the discover, design, and deliver SAP version? Yeah, that one. Um, I no, really I like. mean, we offer, and if you go to that build.me slash learning page, there are actually resources that are connected to each of those stages of the process. And so um, I don't know yet. Yeah, I definitely would say you're welcome to, to use it. It's a, we've spent a lot of time developing it and it's changed a lot. I think one thing I didn't mention is that SAP has been using design thinking for 13 plus years, which is much longer than most organizations. So we've had a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns with our design thinking process. And so this is a, a process that is pretty tried and true because it's it's really, it's I can't even tell you which iteration of this process we're on because we've been through so many. So yes, please. <laughs> Absolutely, continuous development. And I guess um, another thought from me, I guess, on this is just um, how we could possibly apply design thinking into Rotary in our projects. So I guess that's a bit of a takeaway for me to kind of throw into this because that is probably an interesting thing with our service projects. But um, yeah, I mean, thank you very much for your presentation. It's been amazing. Yeah, definitely. And I would uh, encourage you to think about the, that how might we. Um, often what we do is we start with a big how might we and then um, and I think that it's an easy way to apply it to um, to volunteer work or to philanthropic work is think about the big how might we that you're trying to solve for and then uh, narrow in from there based on what you're hearing from people who are in the communities you're serving. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Beck, also in Australia, you have a question. And Beck, I might need you to put that in the chat. We're not we're not hearing you. Um, but go ahead and add that in real quick and we will, we will get that asked. Uh, while she is typing that in, Laura, I, I want to toss out a nice shout out to SAP as well for all of the, uh, all of the good work it does with schools. And I, I love that that's kind of your focus as a, as an educator, uh, you know, I think you said a, a former teacher at one point, but it's a different kind of teacher, right? Uh, so, you know, lovely to see, you know, like a company really step up with, uh, you know, with, with a lot of aid to teachers working to bring these things to their students. So Beck's question is, what's one of the most memorable projects you've worked on in design thinking? And she comments, amazing presentation, look forward to checking out the links. Awesome, thank you, Becca. 
uh, or Rebecca, um, one of the most memorable projects. Um, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of what I do now is really teach the process. And so I think that a lot of my memories come from student ahas, more so than um, projects that I've worked on. Maybe one, one project that I remember and really loved was when I was first learning design thinking, actually. I was uh, working at the D School, had been a student and was working there. And um, I became really interested in how the, the experience of being at the D School felt to students. Um, I think if you uh, Google the D School, you'll see that it's very colorful and bright and um, I think high energy is something you might even feel from just looking at pictures of the D-School. And so I did a little mini project on introversion and the D-School, and I interviewed a lot of people throughout campus to see who, who felt comfortable at the D-School and who didn't. Um, and I think that that was one of the more memorable projects that I've worked on just because it was, it was personally interesting. Um, I felt like it had impact and then it was also pretty early on and I think with a lot of projects and a lot of new things you always the things that you start with are the things that you uh, kind of remember the most or remember most memorably uh, can I share any of the results that's a great question yes I uh, yes um, I I have a whole basically one of the big results was actually that um, the hardest part of the process was the brainstorming process, um, and brainstorming the way that I was talking about it. And if you look at the tips on the um, the sheet, the the page that I was sharing on the PowerPoint, um, it's all about throw out ideas as fast as you can, everybody together, um, like all at the board, standing, uh, shouting, almost like it's it's an overwhelming process. And so I actually in the in the process developed introversion, introvert-friendly <laughs> brainstorming techniques. Um, and so uh, if you go to my website, which is laurampickle.com, in one of the um, projects that I, that I share, I, you can find a link to that, that, um, that introvert's brainstorming document that I, that I made as a result of the, the project that I worked on. Very cool. Well, I'm going to wind things down, uh, and 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 after I do and and finish that piece, well, we'll give Laura the last word because we 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 enjoy hearing you know kind of the the, the finishing word of wisdom from from our speakers uh, as always. So we'll all stay on a little bit after I stop the recording and be able to talk a little bit further as as uh, as it meets time requirements for all involved. Um, but but thank you very much for joining us for for this week. Uh, you know, as as we like to do every week, we want to share stories that, that will allow you to go to other people and say, "Oh my God, this was so interesting! You, you you need to see this." And so we're always looking for for people who have these wonderful stories to tell, who are doing interesting things, who've found creative ways to help their communities. Uh, Rotary is all about service, service to others, and so we we especially treasure the opportunity to talk to people who have found wonderful ways to to address issues and challenges in their own communities. So feel free to let us know, our members, our guests as well. If there's somebody who we should be talking to for a program like this, let us know and we will connect and, and get that in motion. Uh, for visiting Rotarians, if you are looking to make up a missed meeting, then make sure you do the attendance bit just a little bit farther down the page. If you have typed in your email address correctly, you'll get an email address, uh, actually an email, sorry, that uh, you can pass along to your club secretary to make up a miss. And uh, with that, I wanna encourage everyone to leave comments at the bottom as well. Thank you for joining us, and for the last word, I hand it back over to Laurel. Thanks. Yeah, so I would say, while I shared a five-step process, um, it's not nearly as linear as I shared it when the real world. So as you're going through, if you're trying to implement it, um, it's really great to start with a five-step process. It helps to have a process, but then don't feel indebted to the process. If you are bringing in user perspectives and if you are rapidly iterating on prototypes, you're really getting to the core of what design thinking is, and so um, you're on the right path. Cool. We'll see you next week. <laughs>